Today I have on my um, Lafayette Ramblers shirt. Today there's a soccer game and I'm going to watch my son play. And this shirt tells people that I support that team. I'm with that team. I identify with them. As Christians, when we're out and about, when we encounter people in our life, they should see Christ in us. They should recognize that we identify with him. So when we come to this last section in Ephesians, the very last part of Ephesians 6, this armor of God passage, it tells us that we should be clothed in Christ. If you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, that's where we're going to be this morning and talk a little bit. This passage is very familiar to um, all of you because this last section in Ephesians deals with that armor of God that they did last there. And so we've been looking at this, uh, at this letter, and today is the, last, is the last message in this little In Christ series. Now, I have been thinking that, that I, over, we've got two kind of special Sundays coming up over the next two um, with different kind of messages, but when we come back, there may be another, another message that I share with you that kind of is along these lines, but not from Ephesians. And um, we've been looking at this book together because it, it tells us what it means to be in Christ. It tells us what it means to live as we're in Christ. The first few chapters of the book tell us how we came to be in Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 sum that up. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. That was earlier in, in the book, but that's a good summary of all those first three chapters. And then we've been looking in these last few weeks at what it means to be in Christ. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 tell us how that we should, our, our behavior should reflect the fact that we're in Christ. And, um, and our relationships with other people should reflect that. And today we're going to think about the way that we resist temptation should, be, um, should show how we are in Christ. And so we're just going to read, we're going to start in verse 10 and read through the rest of the chapter and finish it out. So it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and, with, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This passage of God, this armor of God passage is very familiar to a lot of you. And the truth of it is, is that when you approach this armor of God passage, there's probably different feelings about it. There's probably two or three ways you could read this and feel about it. I feel like some people love this passage, right? Some people love it. They love the imagery of it. 
Um, they love the, this idea of like a soldier and, and, and this armor. They probably like Braveheart and 300. <laughs> and they, they love passages like this because it kind of harkens back to that sort of thing. And they love that sort of idea. They really can identify with this passage, and it, it, help, it encourages them. Like, it kind of invigorates them as you think about the fact that you have been, you're, you're kind of like a, this warrior for Christ kind of idea, right? There's probably some other people who read this passage, and they're like, none of this is relevant for my daily life. Like, what is modern about this? There's nothing, there's nothing relevant here. It's this ancient kind of image of this soldier, and that does nothing for me at all. I don't understand it. I don't get it. There's probably other people that would look at this and say, well, there's a lot of war talk. There's a lot of war language here, like this soldier for Christ kind of idea. That's like, uh, we're not trying to start a holy war here. What what, what do you mean here? This language is, is different. And so you probably feel a way about this passage. You've probably heard it and know it. In fact, probably all of us have heard a message somewhere, sometime, where we have even walked through all those pieces of armor. If there's, what, six, seven pieces, have you looked at it, of pieces of armor? There's there's probably a message where there's been that many points, and every, every piece has been a point. That's not what I'm doing today, okay? Because the passage, if we get caught up in the armor, we've lost what the passage is about. The passage is about being clothed in Christ. The passage on the whole is how we withstand, how we resist the temptation of the evil one. So let's look at the passage and think about that. If we are in Christ, there should be some defenses in our life that, that, that guard against the evil one, that, that guard against those kind of attacks. And so let's take this passage and kind of see what's the heart of, of being clothed in Christ and recognize the danger that comes from um, the attacks of the evil one and the fact that they will inevitably come to our lives. Let's start with this. In this battle that every one of us are in, when you think about the battle to, to temptation, the battle of sin in your own life, when you think about that, the first thing I want you to see from this passage is that our strength against that, our strength to fight, is not in our flesh and blood. It's not in you that does this. Even though this passage may invigorate you and say, yes, sir, that, that, that fires me up. And you even, you know, paint your face blue and you're ready to, you know, serve Christ. You're ready to be a soldier for Christ. Even though it may make you feel that way, it's really important to recognize that if you're going to withstand the temptation of the evil one, it's not in your own strength that you do that. Amen. If you look to the passage, that's where he starts in verse 10. Now, if you read through the passage, you can understand, because it's given so many times, like in verse 10, notice how it tells us, be strong. You see that command? Look at verse 11. It tells us in verse 11 to stand against the schemes of the evil one. Go down to verse 13. It tells us that we're to withstand the evil one, and at the end of that, it says we're to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore. There's all these commands that are repeated over and over again. That's the command. What do you do in the face of temptation? You stand firm. You be strong, you stand firm. And so when you encounter those commands, you would think by reading this passage that when we do that, the solution is really simple. You just get stronger. You just stand firmer. In those places where you're weak and you seem to fall to temptation, just, just get better, be stronger. That's not what the passage tells us to do. From the get-go of the passage in verse 10, it's important that we make sure that we put our strength in the right place, that we're, lo- that we're looking for strength in the right place. Finally, it says, and remember this is a letter, so he's kind of coming to the conclusion. He's wrapping this thing up. Finally, be strong in the Lord. If you see yourself as a soldier who's prepared and ready to face the evil one, you will be sorely outmatched. Our enemy is much smarter than you and I. It doesn't matter how clever you are, he's pretty clever. And and no matter how powerful you think you are, he's much more. When you start thinking about it in those terms and you start thinking about the fact that really he doesn't have to be that clever. 
Because the same lies and deceptions that he told in the garden are the same lies and deceptions that get us every single time. Now listen to what I'm about to say. He's smarter than you, and he's stronger than you, but he is not smarter than our God, and he is not stronger than our God. When we talk about an enemy, when we start talking about the fact or thinking about the fact that he is strong, that's true, but it's all comparative, right? It's all levels. Yes, he's stronger than us, but he's not stronger than God. See see what I'm saying here? So I never want to give you the impression that there's some cosmic battle for good and evil that is evenly matched. There's not. Our God is sovereign and supreme. That's absolutely true. But for us, this struggle is going to be with us for the rest of our lives. Because we are fallen, because we are living in these corrupt bodies, because of the flesh, we may be saved, we may have the Holy Spirit living within us, right? Without the Holy Spirit, we're completely defenseless to the attacks of the devil. But if we are a believer, then the Holy Spirit resides within us. We are in Christ, and so we have defenses against him. It's important that we, that we clothe ourselves in Christ because without that, then we're just relying on our own strength. Let me tell you some ways that I think people rely on their own strength. We say, well, that thing over there, I would never fall to that kind of temptation because I've been a Christian for 40 years. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. None of that matters. Because here's the thing. If, the, if, it's, if it's on your strength, if it's on your strength, you are, you're just weak. But with him, what happens is, is that if we're to rely on his strength, there are times where we are close to him and there are times we are far away from him. We may have been a Christian for 40 years, but sometimes it's just in name only. Sometimes we're not walking closely with him. And, and as a result, we fall to temptation because we're not clothed in Christ. We've gotten lax. We've slacked off somewhere along the way. Did you know that there is no position of tenure in the Christian life where you get to a place where you say, I am above temptation? It's always going to be. Well, but David, see, I'm not going to fall to it because, see, I know the Bible. I know a lot about the Bible. If the Bible category comes on on Jeopardy, I clean up. I know every one of those answers. I know the Bible, David, so I'm not going to be fooled by the devil. Yep. Because you see, we have that flesh in us. And do you know what we do? You can even know the Bible. You can even see it in black and white. And then you know what we do? We rationalize or just we rationalize or justify how the thing that we're doing, it, it's not really that. See, this is this special, it's this workaround, see. What I'm talking about is the loophole in this. And we rationalize it in our mind, and the devil does that to us. He allows us those thoughts. You can't know so much about the Bible, and you can't have just been a Christian for a long time and escaped temptation. And the truth is, you know what some people will do? They will go to like a position, you know? Oh, see, I'm a pastor. I'm in vocational ministry. I'm, you see, as a pastor... I've, I'm elevated to a different spot where temptation never gets me. You think that's true? Some people don't even need to be a pastor. Oh, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I sing in the choir. I do this. Think about all that I do down there at Center Grove. Satan's never going to get me because, see, I'm really involved. I'm entrenched. Think about all of the scandals that we have seen. Think about all of the men who you have known that have seemingly, and and I believe they have, served God faithfully for years, and then there's one thing. One thing that happens that in some ways tarnishes all those years of faithful ministry. Nobody's ever to a spot. If we start thinking that we are, we're looking to the wrong place for strength. You understand that when we, if we're going to be strong, the passage says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of, uh, this is King James because that's how I learned it, and in the power of his might. The strength that we have is in him. 
That's where it's at. This means that it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, if you have wandered away from God, you are not strong. It doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible, if you are not leaning on the Holy Spirit in order to apply the Bible to your life every day, you're not strong. It doesn't matter what position you hold or what kind of place you serve, if your trust and reliance is not on him, if your dependence is not on him every day, you are not strong. Because what it's asking us to do in the passage is to be strong in the Lord, to rely on him, to have this, nurture this relationship with him, to lean on his spirit. This is how we are strong, by our union with him. That is the only way that we are strong. This passage tells us about the strength of, um, uh, that our strength is not found in our own flesh and blood. But let's look, secondly, at verses 11 and 12 that tell us that our struggle This battle that we are in is not with flesh and blood. It's not with flesh and blood that we wrestle, is what the passage says. You need to understand that the attacks of the devil will come. They will come. It is inevitable. You do not have to be a Christian very long to recognize and understand that the Christian life is not is not a playground, it's a, it's a battleground. It's a place like we, you're, you're in it with the devil. And the truth is, is that as long as you are living for the devil, he doesn't really care how you act. When you start living for the Lord, when you start glorifying the Lord, there's an issue, there's a problem. And I believe that that kind of in, in, increases the attacks that you face. I believe the devil doesn't like that, and I believe you start to experience some things that you haven't before. I never want to present to someone that when you become a Christian, after that, your life's just going to be perfect and roses and wonderful from here on out. That's not what the Bible describes. It's not my experience. And as you as a believer in Jesus Christ can testify, it's not yours either. There's always these attacks from our enemy. This passage, I mean, this struggle that we face will be lifelong. We will always be tied to this sinful nature, and we will all, until we are glorified, until we are glorified and with Him, we will always have this sinful nature with us. Um, and I believe that if you are in Christ, you will feel those attacks on a regular basis. Look at verses eleven and twelve, and what, how it describes them. Let's start with verse twelve. We may work backwards here. Let's look at verse twelve. So it says, "We do not wrestle against flesh and blood." That idea of wrestling is the idea of close, intense combat. It's, it's, you know, when you're wrestling with somebody, you're, you're grappling with them. You're locked up with them. You feel each other's sweat. You feel their breath on you. You're, you, feel their, you feel their muscles tense up and relax underneath you. you. It's close and it's intense. Verse 11 says that this is schemes, right? It's the schemes of the devil. There's our enemy right there. Our enemy is not another person. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Devil is just a word that means accuser. That's all it is. A lot of times these words for Satan are just, they're not names. They're just words that kind of describe what he does. So a a devil is the word accuser. And Think for just a minute about the fact that I believe that the devil is right now accusing, um, accusing us to God. You know, like in the passage, of, you know, in the story of Job, you know, the devil goes to God and says, you know, look at Job. He's just serving and he's just faithful to you because you've given him everything. I bet if you were to take all that stuff away, he wouldn't serve you anymore. It's an accusation. He's also, the Bible also calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. And I believe that means not only does he accuse us to God, but I believe he accuses us to each other. Something happens between me and Cindy. It's a slight problem initially. It's just a slight, maybe it's just something she said that I read wrong until the enemy gets in there and starts accusing Cindy to me. And then I start acting cold to her. Then you know what he does to her? David's kind of giving you the cold shoulder. What do you think's up with that? He's always been kind of snobby. What do you think's his deal? And then there's that, back and forth, you see? And so the things that we wrestle with that are these kind of problems, some of those problems are because 
He's the accuser of the brethren. When you, what are we doing at Center Grove? And the best way not to do that is if he can get in there and make us think things about each other that's not true. Instead of assuming something about another person or letting little things cause this huge invisible wall between us, don't let the accuser of the brethren win because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We sometimes will use Satan, right? And Satan is just like a word that means adversary or enemy, right? And go back to that. He's not an equal enemy with God, right? He's not that. He is already a defeated enemy. In fact, that's important to remember when we think about this struggle. In the struggle, Satan has already lost. You understand that by what Jesus did on the cross, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has given us the victory over death, hell, and the grave. We have victory. So when it comes to the enemy, we're facing already a defeated enemy. I think Warren Wiersbe is the one that says that we should remember as Christians, we are not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. We are already more than conquerors through Christ is what the Bible says. So when we start to feel defeated, it's important to remember that the enemy that we're facing While he may seem strong in that moment, it's like a snake whose head was cut off at Calvary. And that thing's just wiggling till sundown. What we're experiencing is just the wiggling, right? It's dead. It's what the devil's dead. In a very real sense, he is defeated and done. We're just seeing him squirm. This enemy that we face, the devil, is definitely stronger than we are, but not stronger than our Lord. The problem is, like it says in verse 11, we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the, here's the key word, schemes of the devil. King James readers over there, does it have a wiles of the devil? He's wily. He's crafty. See, it would be really easy to say, I want nothing to do with this evil monster with, you know, fangs and horns and uh, cloven feet. I don't want anything to do with that. That's medieval painting devil. That's horror movie devil. Nobody wants anything to do with that. That's grotesque and ugly, and we don't want any of that. But he's very pretty. The problem is he's very pretty. I like this passage in 2 Corinthians. It's good to remember 11, 14, you probably know this, where... Paul tells them that it's no wonder, think about the fact that it's no wonder that we get fooled by him so often because even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. When he comes to us, he doesn't come to us looking evil and he doesn't come to us looking bad and he doesn't come to us looking ugly. He comes to us as the most beautiful thing we've ever seen and we feel like we need that. That's what happened in the garden Right? This was not some, it wasn't an apple, you know, it just says fruit. We don't know it was an apple. Everybody says it was an apple, right? Whatever this fruit was, it wasn't, it wasn't a worm field. It didn't have spots all over it. It was beautiful. I imagine it to be like those in the grocery store that have just got a good misting, you know? There's a little thing of dew on it that's just twinkling there, you know? Looks great. Perfect, no blemishes. And Eve saw that it was good to fill her up. It was pleasing to the eye. And it was good for making her wise. She would be like God when she ate it. And so she took it. It feels good. It looks good. You deserve it. And that's what he says to us. And that's why we buy into it. Because it's a scheme, it's a tactic, it's a strategy that he is using. This is how he does that. And he may tell you, it gets, listen, even scarier than the fact that he uses schemes, there is a cacophony of schemes out there. Look at verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, I'm not going to read all that, a system of schemes, a system of evil Rulers, authorities, powers, it's a system. 
If you think about everything in this world, go to a political system that's bent to turn us. Think about an economic system that's bent to turn us. Think about a cultural system that you see in movies and television. Think about the, the, the cultural or societal world that you live in where there's a system that's bent to turn. All of that is working against you. You as a Christian are attacked on every side by every angle by him. He can use any of that as a tool to turn you any of that, he can even use the church and the pastor of a church, don't trust him, the pastor of a church. Liberty Commentary says this, the devil is the champion of liberalism, ritualism, rationalism, and every other ism that seeks to displace Christ. His aim is to substitute something else and something different for the grace and truth of Christ. Never underestimate the enemy. This is a lifelong struggle. It's against a very powerful but defeated enemy who uses various means of attack in every area of our life. That's the struggle that we face. This passage tells us about the struggle that it's not in our own our strength is not in our own flesh and blood and the struggle that we fight is not against flesh and blood but let's look finally at our strategy let's look for because i think when you get to verse 13 and onward what paul is giving is a strategy that's not from flesh and blood that we win right he's giving us a strategy here that's telling us how to deal with this temptation how to deal with the wiles of the devil notice something in verse 13 Take up the whole armor of God. This is godly armor. It is armor that is of God. It is from God. It is godly in its sense. This language does have kind of a war kind of feel to it. And in some ways, this is a very Old Testament picture of God. There's lots of pictures in the Old Testament that give this, that give this image of God. Let me read some of them to you. I have some of them on the screens, and then we'll talk about kind of what's conveyed, what's being conveyed by these messages. This is from Exodus 15. This is right after they've come through the Red Sea, and the Lord has covered all the Egyptians over with the water. You know, the, the uh, Israelites made it through. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The psalmist in Psalm 35 in verse 1 says, Contend, O Lord, or fight, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and the javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. It's very warlike imagery, the, 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 the language there. How about Isaiah 42? Verse 13, the Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. This is a good picture of our Lord. It's just a picture, right? It's not, in some cases, it's not literally talking about him fighting. The issue there is, is that God, when you look at those pictures from the Old Testament, our Lord is our strength. He is a picture of strength. He is a mighty man of valor. He is a picture of strength for us, right? We, the same way that you would think about uh, an inspiring general riling up the troops. Think, think to Braveheart, and he's on that horse, and he's riding out in front of all that mass of men before they get ready to attack. You know, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. You know, that kind of speech. It rallies people, right? He's that. But he's also our defense. Like, he's strong, and because he's strong, he can be our, our defense. We run to him. That passage said he was our shield, he's our buckler. Other passages say he's our fortress, he's our refuge. We run to him. We can find defense in him. So when we start thinking about this idea of who he is, this picture that you find of him being strong and being our defense, remember that you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are sheltered. You are defended by one who is strong, by one who is able. Don't live as if you're outside of Christ. Live in Christ. Outside of Christ is defenseless. 
in Christ, we have all the defense we need. This is the picture. This is why this message, why the heart of this message is lost if we only focus on the pieces of the armor. Now listen, I'm not against that. I'm not against our kids learning the pieces of the armor. I'm not against a message where we walk through how those pieces of armor convey how we, uh, how we experience defense against the devil. Those are, there's nothing wrong with that. But let's think about it in context for a minute. That's not the whole point of this passage. Whether the, Micah, whether the bridges to this armor, what it is and what it matters, it's not really important. Because the whole passage is about being clothed in him. It's about being clothed in Christ. You see, the problem is, is that when you take that passage and you start talking about every one of those pieces of armor, sometimes in those messages, what we end up doing is we learn more about a Roman soldier than we learn about how to practically walk with Christ in defense against temptation. And the point of the passage is, be strong in the face of temptation. You face an enemy who is strong. Here's the strategy to remedy it. What we find is just a picture. So if you walk through this passage together and you start, say, in verse 14, and you start looking, and you start looking through there, and you were to say, okay, what is the armor? Well, it would be easy to start in verse 14 and say that the armor is belt and the armor is breastplate and shoes and shield, helmet, sword. See all that? be easy to walk through and see that, all those pieces. But all those pieces are the picture. They're the illustration. Go back through and look at the pieces. What if the pieces are not a belt, but the piece is truth? What if it's not about a breastplate, but it's about righteousness? What if it's about the readiness of the gospel of peace? What if it's about faith? What if it's about salvation? What if it's about the spirit, the word of God? What if that's the armor? What if it's not something that you literally strap to your head, buckle it on, and get yourself ready? What if it's not literally that? What if it is just being in Christ? What's interesting about those passage, or this passage to me is, is that uh, and warning, I am fixing to walk through every piece. But instead of us talking about what, I, th I don't think you need an explanation of what a helmet is or what a shield is or how it defends a person. I don't think you need that explanation. You're a smart person. But it's important to note that in Scripture, every one of those things that are described, not the belt, but the truth, not the breastplate, but the righteousness, those things are describing Christ. Look at John 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is truth. In fact, he's so much truth, he cannot tell a lie. He is truth. Look at righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know how we do that? He has all the righteousness. He is righteous. We are not. He gives us his righteousness. When we come to him and, and we surrender our life to him, he takes our sin and in exchange, he gives us his righteousness. The theological impressive term is it's a double imputation we impute to him our sin. He imputes to us his righteousness. There's an exchange that happens there because he is our righteousness. Ephesians 2 and verse 14, earlier in this book, it says that he himself is our peace. The third description there is peace. The one who has broken down the wall of hostility between us and God it says that he is our faith. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it says that we look to Jesus who is the author and perfecter. He is the founder and the originator. He is the one who is perfecting our faith. 
author and finisher, finisher of our faith. The faith that you have does not emanate from you somewhere. You know who, who establishes it in you? He's the author of it. And then he refines it. As you continue to grow in him and you increase in faith, he's the one doing that. He's the one doing it. Salvation. Of course, he's our salvation. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The last piece that's given, when it talks about in verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, John 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down to verse 14, that tells us that the word took on flesh and dwelt among us. And it is through him that we have seen the glory of God the Father. This is Christ. When the passage tells us up in verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Don't get distracted by shields and boots and, and, and belts and helmets. Don't get distracted by all that. Do you know what it's saying when it says take up the whole armor of God? Be in Christ. Be clothed in Christ. Hold to truth. Hold to righteousness. Hold to the word of God. Have your shoes fit and ready for the gospel of peace. Rely on that salvation. Trust in that. Trust in that. This idea that we, that we put on Christ, it's not much of a stretch, right? Right? I mean, verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. If you you have the armor on, you're in it. If If you have Christ, if you're in Christ, you can be strong in the Lord. That in verse 11 tells us to, Put on the whole armor of God, uh, to, to wear. It literally means to envelop in, to be, to be closed up with Christ. Romans 13 and verse 12, which is kind of a passage that runs a little bit parallel to this. Romans 13 and verse 12 says, The night is far gone and the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness, listen, and put on the armor of light. Well, what is that? That sounds impressive. Keep reading. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness or sexual immorality, sensuality, not quarreling and jealousy right here, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Do you know what that means? Don't trust in your own strength. Don't trust in all the stuff you want. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the armor of God. Stand, therefore, take up the whole armor of God and put it on. If you look at that, at the verse, first of verse 10, the first of verse 11, and the first part of verse 13, it's the same command. It's the same thing that it's telling us to do. In every instance, it's telling us to put on Christ. Be clothed in him. You see, You might think that you're finished with the pieces of armor, but when you get down to verse 18, you're not finished with the strategy. Because it says in verse 18 that we are praying all times in the Spirit. Some people try to make this, verse 18, a different section. Look at the passage. It's not even a different sentence. It's the same sentence. We are clothed with him, we are in Christ, and we're in contact with him. It is a daily communication and walk as we stay in contact with him, as we are praying, as we are enjoying fellowship with him. We are clothed in him. We are strengthened by him. He is our defense. This is what it means. Prayer is just as much a part of the strategy as the other things that are mentioned in the text, right? This idea of being vigilant because prayer, it says in verse 18, to stay alert it's going, to be, it's going to keep us alert. Not only are we going to be in Christ, but we're going to be aware of any kind of attack that's coming our way because he has our eyes attuned to it. We are in Christ. You know, this, um, this is, in my estimation, a pretty great conclusion to the letter. Like a lot of things that are mentioned are in this letter over and over again. If you think about the fact that 
It tells us to be strong, at the, at, especially in Ephesians chapter 1, it was telling us that we're empowered by the Lord, that we're strengthened by the Lord. Remember, to do far more than we can even ask or think. That's what Ephesians tells us earlier in the book. That's how he strengthens us. The passage tells us that it has like all of these Christ-like virtues, all of those things, the truth, the righteousness, the, uh, the salvation, all of those things, all of those characteristics that are tied to the pieces, all of them are mentioned at previous places in the book of Ephesians. This idea of putting on, remember if you go back to chapter 4, it told us to take off, essentially like take off those dirty old sinful clothes, put on Christ, to be clothed in Christ. That's what he's calling us to do. It's a great conclusion to a letter. But when I read passages like this that tell me that I should be cautious, I should be in defense against temptation, I'm just going to be honest with you. We talked about this some on Wednesday night. Sometimes, sometimes isn't it a little bit overwhelming? Like if you think about the, 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 the temptation that we face and when you think about all the things in this, about every angle by which we are tempted, it can be overwhelming. You want some more pressure? Um, Douglas MacArthur said, in a speech in we at West Point in the early 60s, I think, there is no substitute for victory. So as a Christian, if we're in this struggle, there's only one option. Well, David, I feel like I fail every day. I feel like no matter what I do, I feel like I'm always, listen, we're going to have times that we fail. You know why? Because we're sinners. We're sinners saved by grace, but we're sinners. We're going to have that struggle. But the pressure is not on you to defend against all that. What's on you is are you in Christ? That's all that's on you. All, dealing with all the stuff that's out there, dealing with every individual temptation that comes, you are to stand firm in the face of all of it, but that's not on you because you are strong in the Lord. That's what you're trusting in. So with every instance that comes, that's all we're doing. Isn't it good to know that when in this thing where we are overwhelmed, like it's very easy to see it as being us and all that. But that's not true. The whole of this passage has said, you are not alone in your temptation. The thing that always gets you, the little deception that the devil brings that always gets you, you are not alone in that. Christ is with you. The greatest ally you need is with you because you are in Christ. Hey, I got news for you. It gets, uh, it gets even better than that. It's not even just you in Christ. What are we doing at Sarah Grove? Look around. You are not in that struggle alone. That same struggle that you are facing, look to your right and look to your left. Same people, those same people are dealing with the same stuff. And if it's not exactly the same stuff as somebody in this room that is, there's enough of us in here, they're dealing with the same stuff. Isn't it interesting that at the end of this letter, he's told them, you have Christ. But he's also said, like in verses 18 and 19, he's saying, look, pray for me. I'm thinking about you, and I want you to pray for me because I need your prayers. I get discouraged in this too. I face the temptation of the devil too, so you pray for me. I want you to pray for me, and that will be an encouragement to me, and I want to help you. I'm going to send to you this fellow, Tychicus, who's an encouragement to me. We know that he was a believer. He's mentioned in several of the letters. He was from Asia Minor, like modern-day Turkey. We know that he was with them when they took the offering to Judea, the, the, the offering that's mentioned in Acts. He helped deliver that. We know that it, from uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy, and from Titus, that Paul had sent him to other people as an encouragement as well. This guy must have been a real motivator because Paul's sending him to encourage. You're not, what he's saying is, you're not alone in this. You have your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you have Christ himself. Let me tell you where that wouldn't be true. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're not in Christ. You're not. 
If the Holy Spirit is not living within you, you're not inside the fort. You're not behind those walls. You're outside. You're defenseless. And it could be this morning that what Jesus is doing is he's saying this morning, if you're ever going to stand up against the temptation in your life, you need me. And he's standing there and he's saying, come, come right through these gates. Come right in through here. Look, today I'm letting down the drawbridge. I'm inviting you to come into the gates. Come and be in Christ. Don't be alone out there. Come and be in Christ with me and my people. Come and join me. This morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as, as, as they come and get something ready for an invitation, there's only one question I want you to ask yourself this morning. And the question is, am I clothed in Christ? That's it. If, you are a, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, then I believe what's going to happen is he's going to show you that you do not have a relationship with Christ. You are not clothed in him. You are not able to withstand the temptation that you face. And you would come this morning and you would just simply give your heart to Christ. If you're here this morning and you're a believer and you recognize that your life is not marked by truth and righteousness and the salvation that you have been given and you're, and you're not taking the gospel of peace and you're not reading his word or trusting it or studying it or there's people when they look at you they do not see a righteous life. You're not in Christ. That doesn't mean that necessarily you're not a believer, but it may mean that you have just simply, you're not, you haven't taken up the whole armor of Christ. You're not, you're not walking in him. You're living, it's the whole point of the letter, is you're not living as if you are in Christ. You're in Christ. If you're a believer, you're in Christ, so behave like it. Live like it. Resist temptation like it. This morning... We know, Lord, that as we sit right here, we are not the people that you desire us to be. We are not the men, the women, the boys, and the girls that you want us to be because we're in a battle. But Lord, we know that you're trying to take us there. We know that you're trying to grow us. We know that you're trying to make us more Christ-like every day. And so, Lord, I pray that if you've spoken to someone's heart through this message today, if there's been a real revelation that they've had not because of anything I've said but because of the scripture Lord I pray that you would bring them this morning to a place of courage where they could come to you Lord help us to honor you by the decisions that we make right now it's in your name that we pray Amen